Okay, we are officially live on YouTube um, in theory. Welcome everybody who is joining. Um, it is Tuesday, everyone's favorite day. Today we are talking about, there we go, um, about our holiday wish lists. So for those of you who are joining um, over in, on Zoom, please feel free to uh, let us know where you're from and how you're doing, what the weather's like, where you are, because it is clear here for the first time in a million years. Um, and I saw um, Ryan out the window last night. It was amazing. Me too. And the moon looks so nice. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yay. Astronomy is back at least for right this second. Um, and for those of you who are joining in zoom, just don't forget to change that little, if you want to participate in the chat with everyone, don't forget to change that little thing that says hosts and panelists in the chat box to everyone so that you can talk to everybody. So the holidays are days away and we have, um, we have a list of our favorite astronomy things that we want to be sharing with you. But you, we also have a special guest today. For those of you who do not know Alendria, how have you not met her yet? Um, Alendria is the editor in chief of Sky News Magazine, Rask's uh, astronomy magazine that you all receive with your membership. Um, if you are a Rask member and for those of you who are just subscribers to Sky News, you receive it on your own. Um, every year Sky News has a, a gift guide in it. And so this year, Alendria is giving us a little sneak peek at the things that are on the gift guide list. Um, one of the things is the telescope that's in the background and I'm sure she's coming back with the actual magazine. <laughs> uh, there we go. Hey, there's a nice book on the other facing page. There yeah. is. <laughs> it just so happens that on that guide of Sky News bookshelf books is one of Chris Vaughn's books. Um, Chris Vaughn co-wrote a book with John Reed. So that's one of, oh, do I have it on me? No, it's in the kitchen. Mm -hmm. No, it's not. Here it is. Ugh. There we go. Yeah. Oh, wow. There it is. 110 things to see with the telescope. This is um, essentially outlines our, uh, the RASC observing program, the Messier program, or the Messier observing program. Uh, that's why it's 110 because there are 110 Messier objects. So um, great book. If you're looking for gift, gift, gifts to give people and also support your fellow RASC members. Um, I don't know if that was going to, that's a free we, one. That's not- We didn't intend list. for this to be an infomercial. We just <laughs> got right into it, didn't we? <laughs> <laughs> didn't mean to. Um, all righty. So thanks everyone for joining and uh, let's hop into it. Chris is going to start us off. We are going to go through our sort of top choices um, for gift items, and you can let us know which ones you like the sound of the best in the chat. Yeah, so I sat down, I thought, for me as a visual observer, what are my most important accessories slash gadgets? And so uh, we'll, we'll kind of count them down in a, in, a, in a round, in turns. And, uh, you know, we're hoping that the viewers can also chime in with their most useful things too, because everybody would be different. But by the time we're done, we should have accumulated a nice set of stuff. So my my top uh, fifth best one was the wide field eyepiece. Mm. And it may not be at first thought something that's that handy as a gadget, but when you buy a telescope, you get eyepieces that are designed to magnify, you know, a certain good amount. But if you want to look for things in the sky without, you know, a lot of go-to help or anything like that, you need a wide field of the sky. And so a low power eyepiece is your friend, especially if you want to do um, a lot of the Messiers and the Rask Finest NGCs. A lot, the galaxies are bigger than you think they are. And so okay. having a wide field eyepiece is really handy. So that's my number one, my, my fifth, how, fifth how of wide, my top five. How wide field? What's your... Um, so I've got, a, I've got a couple here. Is this on G, GS Telescope, the link that you sent for GS Telescope? that is an example Sorry. of them um there's you have a link here for um gso superview eyepieces yeah so the gso superview eyepieces are are relatively inexpensive now these these are this is two inch the the longer focal length eyepieces commonly come in two inch barrel diameters but uh these are terrific easy to easy to look through eyepieces and you can get a set of, I think this is a, this is a 30, you can get a 30, a 40, and a 50 in, the, in this size range. 
Yeah, the one I have, I bought most of my stuff is used. So this is actually uh, a TMB optical, kind of a rare eyepiece. I don't think you find these 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 days. But this is a forty millimeter eyepiece. It's equivalent to something like a a, a Teleview forty mil panoptic. Mm -hmm. So it gives me a uh, about a one and a half degree field of view in my in my um, Dobsonian telescope. But yeah, if you can get a, um, I like the uh, Nagler eighty two degree eyepieces. I know people like the 100 degree eyepieces that are almost look like looking out a window. Mm -hmm. but, um, but to me, I don't know if that's maybe a little too much. But I like the 82 mil, 82 degree ones. But about, okay, that's me. Who's How up much next? do they cost usually? Like, or what's your, what's the price tag approximate? Um, I think the, the GSO Superviews, um, I'm not sure if the prices are on the link that uh, Jenna has to their website, but um, I think they're under 100. The okay. GSO eyepieces, the Teleview tele, Teleview eyepieces, of course, are a lot more, mm -hmm. um, especially the wide field eyepieces that are the heavier, bigger ones. Mm -hmm. So you can be looking at six hundred dollars or more, depending on the on the eyepiece. Okay. But the um, the Naglers that I bought, uh, most of them were used. They were in the two fifty two hundred dollar range used, and you know, deal with somebody reputable, and you get a, an excellent eyepiece that's and previously loved. Okay. Who's up next? Me. Oh, Andrea. Yeah. Um, I thought I would start from the beginning, the list, and so the beginning of life, if you will. How, where do you begin? You begin with something that is for babies. Um, and so my first thing was the uh, Chris Ferry book series for babies. Um, and so, each of these books goes for from something like, I think, 15 to $20 or so. And so whenever any of my friends, and they're all kind of in that stage of life, whenever they have babies, it's like, I feel like this is what I get. Um, it's the, it's like um, general relativity for babies, astrophysics for babies, the ABCs of space, um, the ABCs of science has, um, you know, A is for amoeba. I think my little niece, um, her mom was walking around saying that for a while. Um, and in that way, you're not just teaching babies, you're also teaching parents a little bit more about oh, what general very, very is. <laughs> Sneaky, that's great. Yeah, yeah. And I think Jenna just posted um, a link to Audrey's bookstore. Audrey's the amazing independent book seller in Edmonton. Um, yep, that one's a general relativity for babies. Um, yeah, so I frequent Audrey's when I'm in when I'm in Alberta in town and uh, would suggest cool. that you find it at your local independent book retailer as well. Nice. Excellent. An excellent suggestion. Um, I'm going to be the manic pixie dream girl that I am and suggest kitschy things. Like this is my all time. I, this is one of like the top three rings that I wear. It has the moon phases on it. Oh, they're not, cool. yeah, they're not quite scientifically accurate. And I usually strive for scientific accuracy in my jewelry. Um, there are ones out there that are scientifically accurate. I got this off Etsy and I, I hesitate to post the link because, um, often these are independent sellers and I don't want to totally overload them, but if you search moon phase ring on Etsy, you'll be able to find it. Um, there are other ones that are more scientifically accurate. Generally speaking, I would suggest if you can getting the scientifically accurate ones, um, because then you can start conversations with every single friend of yours and slowly turn them into not your friends anymore. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we, we should say that, uh, I meant to say off the top that we'll share some links to the various um, products and websites and things like that. We're not endorsing any particular vendor or brand. We're just giving you examples of where you can start your research for some of these things. Thank okay, you. that's that cool. Uh, so that's that's going to be my, my number five. I like, I'm loving the fact that, that the two of you are here to, to mix it up and add some dimension, expand the horizons here. I'm, I'm, st I'm, I'm being boring. I'm sticking with the, with the astronomy, the stuff outside. Uh, number two has got to be, or the next one down for me has got to be red headlamp. Um, I know that people think that's important, um, but I got more important ones that are coming. But yeah, so red headlamp um, or red flashlight, anything that's red LED or red light, Here's mine. This one comes from Black Diamond. Yeah. yeah. Oh, I we even have the same color here. Almost. Mine's like that teal green. 
Yeah, these are great. Mine needs a new strap, but that's fine. So this is great. You know, if you drop something in the dark or you're assembling or disassembling your telescope, that's what you want to have on hand or, or making your notes. Although I have, uh, I have another option for when we're making our notes. I'll bring that up later. All right. It wasn't, I think it'll is next, right? Yeah. Me. Um, so the next one that I had is a, a Rask product. And I don't mean to be shameless about my plugging of Rask. However, I'm going to be shameless about my plugging of Rask. This has been one of my favorite tools in exploring the night sky and getting started in exploring the night sky. Um, and so it's the Explore the Universe workbook. Um, when I first started working in the program, it took me a little while to realize that this even existed um, because there are guidebooks, there's the website, there's a lot of stuff, but then this like, and you can print it off, but I mean, if you're going to give it as a gift, you can get it from the Rask shop. Um, really, it just puts it all succinctly into one little book, all of the Explore the Universe program. Um, and so here, for instance, you've got um, different uh, features on the moon and then you mark which log page it'll be on um, and uh, yeah you've got like deep sky objects which is you know where I went first um, my favorite and it's just a really great beginner's guide and for any new astronomer like this is a, an awesome program to just start expanding your horizons it, it's great because it takes everybody past moon and planets right yeah. it takes you yeah. into the all the other really neat stuff that is to look at once you finish yeah. with the moon and planets and getting into observing so you know drawing all of your yeah uh, things and also writing down i hope i mean i'm pretty uh lax with how i write things um but it's you know at the same time it kind of makes it so that when i look back at this in 30 years i'll be like isn't wasn't that a fun time out in the you know forest by yourself <laughs> nice nice cool jenna i uh i'm gonna just follow up on alendria's not with my suggestion just because i am um, lagging behind i sent the link in the chat to the explore the universe program if anyone's interested in um learning more about the actual observing program and what's involved or previewing the book because we do have the pdf available to print there um and we also hosted a series on it on youtube many moons ago um and so if you go to our youtube channel we have extra videos to help you with that observing program um i my next item i'm actually going to steal one from you chris i have one but it's in my uh telescope eyepiece case which is in my car um is those lens pens i freaking love them. They're great. I don't know if you're going to list that one, but I'm stealing it from you. I'm sorry. Thank you. <laughs> they're, they're like double ended lens cleaning devices. And so one has like a smooth cloth end um, and one yeah. has a brush. There's, There's a brush. There. That's for the grit. And then at the other end, you've got a little pad for smudges to take off the oils and smudges. Ooh, la, la. They're yeah. amazing. What's that? It's safe. Yeah. Yeah. I have one, but I've been afraid to touch any lens with it because yeah. you don't want to leave, you don't want to scratch your lens. Yeah. Yeah. yeah as long exactly. as there's as long as there's no grit or debris on the glass, then you're good to go with the I usually go, I give it a, a little bit of a fog up and then I clean it dry with the lens pen. Yeah. They're fantastic because they're small and portable and they have caps over top of the things that are you'll be cleaning them with. So I have I have had little like camera cloths or sorry lens cloths before to wipe the lenses clean um but i leave them attached to the outside of my backpack and then they get covered in dirt um this stays inside your backpack doesn't get dirty and it can be used for anyone who's interested in daytime photography as well as nighttime observing or photography it can be used for all of those mm -hmm. uh which makes it very versatile it's also relatively inexpensive um so i definitely recommend yeah just need to change them up every few years mm, as they get yeah used up. that's a good one Sorry, I stole it, Chris. No, it's fine. That's the whole point. Uh, what do I have next? Uh, my next one is Sky Safari. I don't know if we if we knew that we were allowed to say apps, but man, oh man, oops. When I'm observing, I want to use Sky Safari. Um, what's great about it is that you it has an advanced search tool. You can search for categories of objects. You can see what's up tonight. You can um, download lists of observing targets 
and it'll annotate the sky with all those targets with little circles. And what I do is if I'm, say, doing the RAS double stars program, I'll bring them all up. And then as I, as I finish one, I'll go into the observing list and I'll delete it from the observing list so the circle will disappear so I can just work my way up, down the sky. So that's, my, that's what I have at the eyepiece. And what I do is I have it on my tablet. And what I do is I grab red film and I slip it inside my tablet case and I can have my sky safari at hand without ruining my dark attitude. So that's mine. And Blake Nancaro in one of the previous editions of Sky News, and I can't remember off the top of my head which one, if you need some red film, you can always get some baby bells. And yes. Tape, <laughs> tape those together and put them on your tablet if you can't find yourself some regular red film. Never yeah. occurred to me. I guess that would work really well if you have, like if you're, this is going to sound, um, very amateur to the people who've been doing astronomy or going outside for any length of time. But if you only have your phone flashlight, that would work really well for that. Yeah. Cause yeah. you could just, cause it's a very small, very point source of light. It would, it would work very well in an emergency for well in an emergency in which you need that you, light. You can buy um, tail light replacement, tail light repair tape, which is clear red. That the Canadian tire. You could just throw that over any flashlight, eh? Any little, any little LED or yeah, any little flat narrow flashlight. Very clever. Very clever. You can do that. Cool. All right. Who's next? Well, Andrea, back to you, I think, right? Wait. Yeah. I just, I'm trying to think about, cause like I didn't exactly order mine. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So what I might do is just yet another shameless plug for sure. the RAF observer's calendar. I was going to uh, shamelessly uh, plug my next one. So I have to think. Yeah. <laughs> That's all right. That's all right. Well, this is a dual plug. Um, okay. I mean, mine's on the wall right now. I'm looking at it, not that you can see it. Um, I mean, I can always see this, like there it is up there. This yeah. Is and it's not only uh, like handy and it has all of the dates and times of events there, it's beautiful. It's got some great photography from um, RASP members and it's it just brightens that little corner of the room. Nice. Nice. It's a really nice combination of art and function, I think. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And a total, like it's a great gift if we're talking about holiday season stuff. That's right. Yeah. Cool. Okay. Yeah. Um, I will shamelessly plug, although in my case, I'm not shamelessly plugging the RASP this time. I'm going to shamelessly plug um, Nicole Martellaro. Uh, we do help her publish this book, I believe. Um, but she has a great book that is out in its second edition. It's called The Night Sky Almanac. We sell it at rask.ca. Again, I'm going to share um, the screen. Oh, Alendria has copy. Sorry, possibly. I don't have copy. I just have the little review. Oh, the review. Oh, excellent. Okay. Um, these are, so many of you, I expect, are Rask members already. If you're not, let us know in the chat. Um, and then sign up for membership. Um, Rask memberships, also a good gift, but regardless. Um, this, this particular book. Um, it's not quite like the Observer's Handbook, which comes out every year and goes to every RASP member. Um, the Observer's Handbook is really, really intense. This makes a very good gift for someone who is not as intense as the standard RASP member. Um, so someone mm -hmm. who's like casually going out and observing um, or uh, it's not, oh, it's, it says it's out of stock on our website. I apologize. Um, that will be fixed shortly, I'm sure. Um, it's very... It's a nice summary of um, the stuff that's happening that year in an accessible way. And in, this, in terms of the stuff that you would actually, like the casual observer would actually be interested in. The yeah. Observer's Handbook can go into a lot of detail, a lot of like really, really big detail that most people don't need. So things like, you know, that after a couple of years of reading maybe the Night Sky Almanac that you will be interested in. Things like when stars are going to be near the moon or like specific stars are going to be near the moon or, or what have you. So there's a lot more detail in the observer's handbook, but the night sky almanac is a, an excellent alternative, especially for um, friends uh, who are maybe not in into astronomy as much as you are yet. Cool. All right. My turn. So we're getting down to my top two items that I would not go out observing with them. And number two is, this this is a tell red and what this is is it's it, it's a finder scope 
mm-hmm. quote unquote finder scope, but it doesn't magnify the sky. What you do is you, it has a battery and a little mechanism that projects a bullseye mm-hmm. onto this glass plate. And when you sight from behind it, you see the bullseye superimposed on the sky. And that means that you can then, it's fixed to your telescope. And then as you swing your telescope around, you can center the bullseye whenever you want to, wherever you want to. And I find it really terrific because it doesn't flip the image or, or do anything crazy with the sky and everything's great, unmagnified. And that's what we used in, in the book. Yeah. So every, every page, every item has the Telrad bullseye marker on it. And we took great pains to, um, to line those up. And by the way, you can also set such sky safari up. So it displays a tell red bullseye against the sky too. So you can actually, I use that too. I look at sky safari on my tablet and I look at the real bull, the real bullseye and I get everything lined up. And if you use your, your wide field eyepiece, then usually the object's right there. No fuss, it's no muss. Bullseye, so it has like concentric circles. See if I can make this shine. I don't know if you can see it. Oh, there, oh, there it? it is. There it is. Yeah. 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 Awesome. And the the rings, and you can also enable these in um, Stellarium as well. These um, these Telrad rings. So the smallest ring is half a degree. This is the diameter of the moon. The next ring is two degrees, and the outer ring is four degrees. So the outer ring is a little smaller than a binoculars field, but it helps you. You can really what I do is I say, okay, that star to that star, I need to put the central ring on that line between them. And it's really makes it easy. So that's my favorite. Second favorite. That's a good one. How much does that take back? Um, so I, I, I put the, uh, the link to Maison L'Astronomie in Montreal. They have, the, they have the most reasonable priced one that I've seen. Um, it's, I think, about $55. Okay. And no question, if you buy... If you buy a, a six inch Dobsonian or, a, or an eight inch Dobsonian for someone starting out, we recommend that telescope a lot. Mm-hmm. Comes with a finder scope. They all come with a finder scope. Immediately just tack an extra $60 and get your Telrad and mount it on there. And you'll have no problem finding everything you can find. Let's go. Cool. Highly recommend. Okay. Thank you, Chris. All right. Well, Andrea, you're up. I'm up. Okay. Well, I mean, I know you said no scopes, uh, but <laughs> I put a scope in there. Um, and, and not only like I, you know, I, I know that a lot of people say that it's, you should start with binoculars. I started with binoculars. I didn't really find it. Like, I don't know, I'd end up going out to a place, taking out the binoculars and being like, great. And then putting the binoculars away, usually because there were too many mosquitoes. Um, <laughs> so uh, when I got my scope, though, it was like I had made the investment. I had brought the scope somewhere, and so I felt like I had to use it, and so I was much more likely to use it. Um, and so I put um, Jenna just posted the link to the one that I have, which is the Explore Scientific First Light 80 millimeter refractor, which I set up behind me for demonstration purposes. It has not a Telrad, but it has a red dot finder um, that yeah. comes in it. Similarly, it, um, you know, you look at the sky. Yeah, exactly. And That's a red dot finder. Yeah. yeah. It's yeah. just a dot instead of a circle, but yeah. yeah. Same, same uh, way that it's used. Um, and I think it's great. Uh, it's a great starter scope. Um, I also included there, I think, a couple of articles uh, that were written by Alan Dyer. Um, one of the reasons I went with the Explore Scientific um, first light um, was because he had written about this and recommended it. He said it was for kids. I got it with the equatorial mount. And so it's a little hand hand mount or hand driven mount. Um, here, I'll post these. There are two articles that I would suggest reading the November, December, 2020. Um, and that's a review of three starter scopes, including this one um, in the May, June, 2021. Uh, has recommendations based on the purpose of your scope. And so, you know, there are recommendations for little tabletop Dobsonians if you're going to be traveling more or um, bigger Dobsonians if it's going to be in your backyard. Okay. For instance. Um, and yep, Chris, you just posted as well. And uh, yeah, so that, and that's 
this scope has been great. It's been, I've also, I don't know if I could include this in the gift. This is a gift that I want. Because <laughs> I made myself a dry bag. I think I've shown Jenna oh, yeah. so that I can carry my telescope on a canoe. Um, it's not Fantastic. Um, like the inside comes out all the time. Uh, whereas I would have ideally liked it to stay inside. So if anybody out there has, you know, sewing machine and however, whatever plans in order to make like a proper dry bag for a telescope, I totally use them and adapt them to this scope. Um, and the mount, oy, I took the mount out there and it got quite dirty um, in the rain one day. And so it, I don't know if it's covered yet. Cool. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, the, the link I put in there is that um, about every year around this time in my, my astronomy skylights, I, I write a little story about telescope buying tips. So that's why I posted that one. And before Janine goes, because Janine just posted in the chat as well, and I think it's a great idea on the topic of um, like sort of homemade or custom gifts, Janine was saying that a good idea, idea for gifts for others or for yourself is to have a local jeweler incorporate family or other jewelry that's no longer in style. Um, into a th astronomy themed jewelry and so she had her mom's opal ring um, turned into the sun in a stylized solar system pendant which I think is super super cool yeah um, and and just like a really nice way um, to use jewelry that you might not otherwise have used or feels like it's maybe out of the current style I think that's a really fantastic idea. idea yeah I really like that yeah um, and on that note I was the the thing that I was going to say which I can't really quite promote I mean, I have a, I have a Carhartt too, but I was going to say warm weather clothing um, because um, it's uh, about to be winter. And if you're going outside in the winter, um, it sucks. So, well, if you're a, a warm blooded person and you're going outside in the winter, it's not great. One of my favorite things uh, that I have is a pair of gloves that comes with mitts that have a zipper on the back so that you can zip them open and stick your fingers out and do stuff and then tuck your fingers back in. Um, and so those are excellent when you need dexterity and you need dexterity when you're observing. So that was going to be um, my gift guide or my gift guide suggestion. But one last thing that I will say is that if anyone is crafty, you can make stuff yourself as well. So if you're, if you're good at knitting, if you're good at um, sewing or quilting or anything like that, um, there's nothing more fun than incorporating astronomy stuff into the things that you wear. So I recommend that. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. We'll come back to some of these uh, topics and elaborate a little bit more mm -hmm. rest of the show here. Um, all right. So my, my number one, now it's not glamorous, but my number one accessory, if you're an observing an uh, astronomy, if you're an observer, it's got to be a dew shield for your telescope. Um, you can get everything set up, observe for 10 minutes and then get wiped out if you get frost or dew on the end of your telescope in your object objective lens. And so if you've got a Dobsonian where it's the deep tube with the mirror at the bottom, it's not such, not such a critical thing. But if you have a refractor or a schmidt cassegrain other type telescope, buy, buy or make a dew shield. This is just flat craft foam with an elastic band around it that sits at the end of a refractor. But uh, you've got to have something like that to control the dew. And you can get more fancy. You can buy commercially made ones. You can get heaters that do the same job. But um, yeah, you've got to have that on hand if you plan to be observing either in the humid summertime or the frosty wintertime. That's boring, I know, but that's, I, you're right, I couldn't though. manage without. You're right, because if you go outside and you're all ready to observe, and you've especially if you're in Toronto and you've driven like 40 minutes to get to a dark site, and then your telescope fogs up, it's extremely disappointing. Yeah. Um, and it feels like you've wasted all your time and energy. Also don't, I don't, sorry, I was checking different feeds when you said this, but I don't know. And so I don't know if you said it, put it on first, put it on immediately. Don't wait. Oh yeah. Which is yeah, what yeah. I did that first time when I went out with you, Chris, and I waited and then it got fogged up. And then I was like, oh, I didn't think I needed this until later. Grr, grr, grr. So <laughs> thank you. Yeah, yeah, it's just, just part of your assembly right off the bat. Yeah. And that's winter or summer. I, I you always need it. Yeah. yeah. Okay. That's me, Alendria. Oh, me again. Um, okay, I have two. What a surprise. <laughs> wow. Thanks. Um, uh, uh, I just, I have two things. Can I finish off with two things? 
And I think that Chris would agree with me on one of these things. It would be the Backyard Astronomer's Guide. Yeah. Yeah. That's a, that's an excellent, an excellent accessory um, for sure. Yeah. I've got yeah. mine sitting over here. Yeah, there's it's, a, it, it's a tome, but it's, it's a uh, man. You read it cover to cover and you're set to go yeah. for and sure. This year. So it's a great gift. I would say that this would be, you know, the, this for the astronomer in your, in your life. Chris wrote a review in our November, December issue, which is why I brought him up. Uh, yeah. But it's beautiful. Oh. Okay. Is that backwards? No, it's it's it. They mirror you in Zoom, but we oh, see but you're seeing it well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You'll see the review if you take a look at the review. But um, it's encyclopedic. I cover everything. That's yeah. amazing. Yeah, and and equipment uh, with pricing, what to buy, mo current models, uh, tours of the sky, tours of the moon. Yeah, yeah. that is a great suggestion. An excellent, yeah. excellent, excellent guide. Um, and the other thing that I had on my list, I got this one from All Star Telescope, um, also out in Alberta. Um, but it is my Bader Planetarium Mark IV zoom lens. It's the, yeah, my two votes. Yeah, it's way better um, than needed for my scope, but it, I like it. It's good. It's so good. It's like, and yeah, it's, uh, what can I say about it? Like I've been using this one almost exclusively now since I got it. Um, and, you know, I've done some pretty awesome like parking lot astronomy stuff, showing people Saturn and Jupiter and watching their eyes light up. Um, and then, you know, you can just zoom, zoom, zoom. And, you know, yeah. like I telescopes in a dry bag, I wanna keep my equipment as light and easy as possible like so that I can take it out to different places and really quickly um, without having to carry around like a whole bunch of little knickknacks that I'm invariably gonna lose. Um, and so this makes my life really easy. Yeah, so it's a forever eyepiece. Yeah. Like don't, don't, be, don't be too worried about spending a little more for a good hyper, uh, better yeah. Hyperion zoom. Because you'll you'll keep it through every telescope you ever own. You'll just keep it and upgrade the telescope, but keep the eyepiece. Exactly, and there are little adapters too. So, like I've got the um, I forget what size this is. You've got yeah, the that's the one. Size. That's the one and a quarter, and I've got the two inch on mine. Yes, exactly. Yeah, and, yeah um, the um, couple things to bear in mind is that the uh, the mechanism inside a zoom eyepiece means that it'll actually darken faint objects a little bit. So if you're out, if you're chasing galaxies and nebulas, it's not maybe swap it out with the appropriate focal length eyepiece if you have it. But um, for outreach, these are fantastic. So we bought the set of these for the David Dunlap Observatory for Rask's outreach at DDO. Mm -hmm. You just put them on all the telescopes on, out on the grass and then zoom in, zoom out, zoom in, zoom out. It's great. I will say of all the things we've recommended so far, that is the one that I look at and I'm like, oh, I should, I should ask for that. Um, because that I don't have one yet. And like, I, I don't know about you all. I, I actually, that's a lie. I do. I know you both love showing this guy to people. Um, I don't know about you all out on the internet. Um, but, but um, it's like, it's one of my favorites. It's so much more fun doing astronomy when you have other people with you and you can like, especially with, the planets and the moon and the stuff that's bright that's close by sharing that with someone for the first time is just like it makes you want to live like it's just such a nice feeling so i'm um, definitely high on my list of good ideas from you too yeah especially like saturn you show somebody saturn and you can say well now i can make it bigger <laughs> yeah. Yeah. and it'll, it'll yeah. triple in size because the range the focal length is 8 to 24 millimeters so you can triple the size I have a question, which is, um, as you zoom in, do you have to refocus too? Um, I don't think you do with the batter. Some other uh, uh, cheaper zooms you might have to, but I think the batter is a focal. I think it stays, cool. or par Very focal, cool. stays in focus the whole time. My so. initial focusing was kind of bad to begin with, and I have to adjust that way. Um, but if it's good, you don't have to readjust. Yeah. And you can also zoom in, focus it, and then zoom back out, and it'll be crisper. Mark, Ooh, very nice. Okay. 
uh, they have to refocus theirs. So I guess, uh, yeah, Mark has the beer. And they have the butter zoom. So yeah, maybe it's. Maybe I just haven't been. And I, again, like yeah. I don't really go to the full zoom very often because it doesn't really, um, it, it's too wide for my telescope, but uh, yeah, so. Okay, that's cool. Yeah, that's a highly recommended one. And again, you don't have to spend a lot of money on an expensive zoom lens, but you do get what you pay for sometimes. So we can we can unreservedly recommend the Bata Hyperion zoom to anybody that wants a zoom lens. And as I say, the sticker shocks offset by the fact that it's a tremendous eyepiece. You can resell it. You can keep it forever. It'll never fail you. And it's a good eyepiece. It'll never yeah. let you down. Yeah. And Phil was the one who recommended it to me uh, initially, Phil Groff um, from Rask. Shout out to Phil's executive director. Yeah. <laughs> Who's in the chat. So if you have further questions. <laughs> oh. um, and I'm going to, my last one is not something that you could get for this holiday season, probably, but I wanted to drop it anyway, because I'm so excited about it. Um, we have new t-shirt designs coming out. I am so excited. I, you have no idea. I've been wanting these for years. Um, they are sort of like vintage poster themed. Um, so this is one and their advertisements for traveling to exoplanets, which if anybody knows what I do for most of my work, um, at RASC, it's all exoplanet related. Um, so it's very, very exciting highlighting J1407b, which is a system that has a planet like Saturn, but with rings that are 90, yeah, 90 million kilometers across, which is insane. It's huge. Um, and then there, there's J1407b. I am still pushing to have this put on like an observing book or something like that, or like a log book. Um, and we also have one for Kepler 22b, which is an ocean planet. Um, and so we have a little, <laughs> isn't that great? <laughs> this is great. Little surfing, uh, surfing astronaut. Um, I'm so, so, so excited for these to come out. You have no idea. I don't think they're going to come out in time for the holidays this year, unfortunately. Um, but keep an eye on the RASP website and on our newsletters and such, because uh, they are certainly one of the first things that I'm going to be buying. Uh, literally, as soon as they're available, I'll be purchasing them. So um, that is my last recommendation uh, for my top five. So for birthday present in February? Yes. Yes. I was trying to think of like other holidays that come up that people can buy presents for. Um, the summer. Happy well, Groundhog Day. <laughs> Groundhog Day, cross quarter days, equinoxes, solar solstices. There's lots of options here. Yeah. yeah. Nice. Um, so that's, that's going to be my last one. Um, now, out of the ones that we selected and other people selected. So what, Alendria, what was, what's your all-time favorite? And we, I've already shotgunned the Zoom ones, so you can't say that. <laughs> I'd really, I don't know. I love um, your dry bag. No, the one that I've been using the most, again, the Explore yeah. the Universe workbook. I love it. I'm gonna, I'm probably gonna give some away to some kids that I know who, who are really into, into astronomy. Um, because I think it's so like so easy paper and you know and it, it just opens up the skies. That's I'm gonna go with that. Oh, that's a great one. And Chris, for you? Oh, there's no question for me. Telrad. It's the Telrad. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. If you don't have one, you need one. <laughs> if you're a visual observer. You have a go-to telescope is not as important, but if you want, if you're trying to do things manually, it's a fantastic investment. Mm -hmm. Excellent choices. Um, of those three, do you want me to make a poll and people can see what their favorites are? And while we do that, you can share your subpar suggestions. <laughs> <laughs> subpar suggestions. So yeah, while you're doing that, so some I saw somebody in the chat asking about Stellarium versus Sky Safari. Yeah. And let me just reply to say that uh, Stellarium now has a paid app, which is a little more functional than the older free app. Um, and I have, but I haven't used it. I'm afraid. But I hope to soon. But um, I do. I think I give the edge to Sky Safari, and it's for the fact that you've got the ability to plot 
field of view indicators and put tell rads on the sky and label observing list items and um, in addition to all the things Stellarium does. So for me personally, that's the one I would I, I work with. I go I go to, but you know there could be others that are up and coming or that other people swear by as well. So whatever you're comfortable with is the one. Mm -hmm. That's mine. There was also a comment here um, from David Hoskin that if you do forget your dew shield on a 12 volt, you can, if you have a hair dryer, um, a 12 volt hair dryer on a cool setting will get rid of the dew for you. And then you put on your dew shield. Um, yeah. Though I don't usually carry my hair dryer with me when I go stargazing. So, so. Chris can attest to this, technically speaking, working. It just wasn't that good. Um, what I did the time that I totally messed up and didn't put the dew shield on is take those like hand, hot, like hand warmer thingies, um, throw them inside of the dew shield and then wave the lens cap at it to get some of the moisture out of the air and get the air circulating. Yeah. Yeah, that was, technically speaking, it worked. It also worked, um, technically speaking, if you don't have a dew shield, you can in theory tape those to the to the telescope itself to keep the mirror warm which will keep dew from settling on it mm -hmm. um and so those two unsustainable life hacks uh are options as well well jenna did you put the hand warmer in and then cap the telescope for a few minutes or did, I did you yes i like heated it i tried to heat it up like an oven and i don't think i'm, I'm not sure that worked but... it may have helped it may have sped things up a little bit but you know yeah. obviously everybody should take caution with putting heaters near their lenses, of course, but it can, it can, in an emergency to save an evening's observing. Yeah. Something like that. All right, we're going to run out Yeah, I've had people like... just wrap, you know, hand warmers around the outside. Oh, here's oh. the poll. Okay, great. Yeah, so here's the poll. For those of you who are um, participants, I believe you can answer it. Chris and Alondria, you may not be able to, but you already gave your opinions. You already gave I... your opinions. <laughs> <laughs> Don't get angry. Um, it's a multiple choice. So if you want to choose all of them, you can choose all of them. Um, and Lisa suggested in the chat as well, USB coffee cup warmers work too um, on telescopes to keep them warm. So I would just suggest being crafty and have the mind of an engineer, even if you are, aren't one, which is come up with interesting solutions with the materials you have on hand. <laughs> yeah. Alrighty. Oh. Oh, all right. I'm going to give us another 10 seconds to answer before uh, I shut down the poll. Do we have any? Wait, Alendria and Chris, can you see the results? No. No. Uh, can you bring it up again? Ready? I didn't see the, I didn't see the results. Two, one, and here are the results with the zoom lens coming out just on top. Tell Rad right below that and explore the universe below that. But they all did pretty well. We're like, just that, that you know, that's pretty good. Um, yeah. Thank you for voting. Cool. Very yes, exciting. excellent. Um, so we can go through a few more. Maybe a quick pause um, for any questions that people have. If you have questions, you can throw them in the chat or in the Q&A. Um, I'll be keeping an eye on the chat on YouTube as well. Um, one question from Mark already, which is what type of lithium battery is recommended for a dew shield? I think... There are two things here. There's a dew shield, which is just like a, a static piece of thing that keeps dew from settling. It, it physically keeps dew from settling on your mirror by being long, yeah. um, which doesn't require battery. So hooray. Um, but when it comes to dew heaters, which heat up the outside of your, of your like front glass mm -hmm. or your mirror, dew heaters require a battery. Yes. So dew control, dew heaters can use a lot of power. A lot of um, our friends that use them actually have a battery dedicated just to their dew heaters, maybe a car 12 volt battery or a deep cycle marine battery just for their dew heater controllers. Um, so the part of the trick there is to, you just need to warm your telescope just very slightly enough to, to keep the frost or the dew from condensing on the, the front of the lens. So you need to sort of keep it turned down. Um, I actually have a, a little heater on my secondary mirror in my Dobsonian telescope that just uses a nine volt battery and it lasts for a year, maybe before I have to change the battery. It's just sipping power. Um, I shared this little find that I, that I found on, on Amazon. You can see this very well. So this is a, 
dew strap, a uh, warm, a heating strap. It's actually of a size that you could use on a camera lens or a coffee mug or an eyepiece or a small refractor. And it's USB. So it's, it's a uh, USB and it's got actually three settings, low, medium, and high. So you can set it to different ranges. A lot of the professional dew heaters that you could get from Kendrick and things like that, um, they are, they run off the 12 volt supply and they actually have almost potentiometers where you can turn them up and down. And Kendrick also sell automated systems where it, it measures the dew point, it measures the temperature and it, it actually pulses power in and out to the heater just to maintain whatever's needed for the telescope. So that's kind of a more of an advanced session topic, but yeah, this one I got on Amazon. It was around $23 or something like that. I haven't tested it very much yet, but I'm looking forward to using it this winter. And I'm looking at Orion. Oh yeah. One of the things I'll mention too, when you're talking about this stuff, um, there's a couple of people who are coming up in the chat saying stuff like they've kind of made their own or they've, they have plans to make their own. Um, I would recommend for anyone who is, um, who is like has any kids who are techn technically capable when it comes to building their own stuff, or if you're interested in building your own stuff, encourage that by like offering courses or maybe even um, it depends on how you see gifts. If it's something that you know that your, your relative or your friend might be interested in, maybe try doing some research yourself and seeing if you can find the plans and what's needed um, for something that they may want to build themselves. If they enjoy the experience of building things themselves, um, there are a lot of opportunities to do that in astronomy. And, and that's sort of, I mean, that's one of the ways amateurs have contributed to the field is, is they've done a lot of building themselves of, um, yeah. of mounts and of dew heaters and of tracking types. Like there's all sorts of things that you can build as an amateur. So um, it's a hobby that appeals well to um, makers. Yeah, most yeah. RAS centers have uh, kind of a handy person or a, or a DIY person. A Blake and Blake Nancaro in our center, Toronto Center, is known for that. He's done talks on building his own dew heater strap using um, toaster wire or hair dryer wire. That if, if you have a hair dryer that the motor died but the wire is still good, yeah. Landry has got hack articles in Sky News as well. Awesome. Yeah. So this was Blake's story, and he mentioned the dew heater um that he built um and kind of threw up the plans there um and this story is in the july august issue hacking nice. years. yeah yeah awesome. okay so um and sky news gift subscription also a good gift anyway sorry yes chris <laughs> yeah well that, that's that's in the bottom of our list that's coming up in our list later on our list yeah. um and any more questions jenna before we just dive into some of the things we look we overlooked so far nope we can just dive into some more things um so, i will ask that we wrap up by 4 45 today if at all possible okay we'll see if we can do that all right so um i just sent um i just tabulated everything i could think of that might be a useful gadget and i shared my list of items with the the unranked list with uh, alendria and jenna so um the first item in no particular order i've just got you know keeping yourself warm in winter so heated apparel you can have battery powered jackets and foot warmers and gloves. I haven't personally used any of those, but I know people that swear by them. I don't know, have you? My dad has a jacket and he also says that it's great. Um, somebody wrote a letter in our upcoming edition, the Jan January, February issue. And they said uh, snowmobile boots are great for stargazing because they're huge thick and you can put on like multiple pairs of socks yep yep um new zealand possum wool socks are amazing so my sister lives in new zealand and she sent me a couple of pairs of those and they're fantastic possum wool um, possum wool yes, yes. it's actually made out of possum it's made yes. out of possum wool yes um fun fact possums are a pest in new zealand they're not indigenous to the island so any, any, um, any good use for possum is, is welcome in New Zealand. And so that's one of the uses they've come up for, for possums. Yeah, they have pretty possums, not like, the, not like the sort of homely ones we have in Canada. I'm not going to get into it, but those possums are very useful. They eat ticks and that's, no one likes ticks. Possums are great. Don't hate on possums, Canadian no, or no, otherwise. <laughs> no, but 
in, in New Zealand, because New Zealand's a, a closed ecosystem, you know, things were introduced into the island that, that shouldn't be there. So the possum is, is one of the things that eats the kiwis and things like that, which they don't like. So, so that, that's why they, that's why they like to make them into socks. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, the next up we, we touched on it are the hand and foot warmers. You can get, you can get different types. You can get the kind that you, um, you boil to reset and then you can activate them. And they're like, uh, you know, they're like um, potatoes in your pocket. They're sort of hard, hard and hot um, blobs in your pocket. I find they don't last very long, but these ones are made with, um, with iron and they re it reacts to the oxygen. And so you get a, a hotter heat and a longer duration heat with these. And they're sealed up because once the air heat hits them, the reaction begins. But you can, if, if you haven't finished using it if it hasn't run out you can put it in a baggie at the end of the evening and seal it up airtight and then bring it back out the next day and continue using it. that's a cool one and you I can will, buy rechargeable ones as well i will also mention that those ones so i am all for rechargeable ones or the ones where they um there's like a chemical reaction and that is an oxidation but it's crystallization yeah um, that's so the one can, i meant yeah yes um, and, but I recommend buying the reusable or sorry, the disposable ones as an emergency in your like backup emergency kit, mm -hmm. um, because they are, you don't want to be without heat. Yeah. If you need it. yeah. Um, I also had on our list and you may have been surprised. I said a big garbage bag or a telescope case, because what beginners often don't realize is that if they've been using their telescope out at night in December, January, February, and they bring it indoors, it immediately gets coated with frost and then it, and then it melts and it becomes a liquid puddle mm -hmm. all over everything. So the trick to avoid that is to put it in its case, cap all the optics before you bring it in the house. Or if you don't have a case for your telescope, green garbage bag or a plastic garbage bag and cinch it up around the, the neck of the mount and just let it warm up slower. So it can't, the air house air can't get on. It. I have questions. Um, so would that mean that if you have if you have a plastic garbage bag around your telescope, would that mean that the garbage bag would get wet and dewy on the outside because the air is condensing on the cold through the bag? Well, what you're doing is is the moisture in the air makes contact with the cold plastic or metal of the telescope and condenses onto it. And as more air arrives, more water gets deposited. So by putting the bag around it, you're at least limiting the amount of air available to deliver its, its water moisture, its water vapor to your telescope. That's all you're doing really. Cool. Or you could, yeah, yeah. Like you could have one of these homemade dry bags which are insulated with foam. Uh, in theory, that would also help with yeah. the- So just try to make it as airtight as you can, bring it indoors and the next morning when everything's warm at room temperature, then you can open it up and let it air anything that might, might've been moist. You can air it then. And then use your, your optics pen to clean off any little drop. If you need to. Yeah. After, after every, you know, every, every few sessions, I'll just sit at my kitchen table and use my lens pen and yep. clean all my eyepieces. It's fun to do. <laughs> All right. So the next category I had, and, and by the way, folks can share, you know, if they've got other ideas, but let's move on. Uh, next, next category I had was gadgets that are on your telescope. So I mentioned the Telrad, I mentioned the zoom lens, I mentioned the Zeus super view eyepiece, uh, filters. So if you don't have any, uh, nebula filters for visual observing, you can use narrow band filters. And one of the most economical places that I've shopped is uh, DGM Optics. And they have a nebula filter that's amazing. I've got one, it's amazing. The people that I've recommended um, them to, they love them too. And what's cool is that you can buy, they have blemishes or seconds. So, and they're discounted. So you can, you can save some money and they work just like the full price ones do. So I bought a, I bought a blemished one mm -hmm. and you can't see the blemishes, they're just, Something's wrong with them that you, you know, in the, you know, a paint chip or something. So, so would it be, would the seconds be good for people who are doing visual observing and then the not seconds um, would be good for people who are doing imaging? No, these I are strictly for visual. visual. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, okay. You know, if you, if you follow uh, Trevor Jones, the uh, Astro Backyard, you know, he recommends the, um, the L Enhance for astro, for astro imaging light pollution filter, but for 
things like um, brightening up uh, emission nebulas, you know, North American Nebula, Pac-Man, Orion Nebula, the the Oxygen-3 filters are great. The um, UHC filters are great. And this, um, it's called um, NPB, NPB filter that they sell at DGM Optics is fantastic as well. So um, the O3, the O3 tends to be a little more restrictive. So the image is a little dimmer, but the, um, the UHC and the NPB N- uh, P, B filters, I'll let a few more wavelengths through so that the nebula tends to be a little brighter, a little bit larger. So highly recommend that. Uh, let's see, we talked a little bit about dew heaters already, dew shield already. Um, variable polarizing filter. So especially if you're looking at the moon, you can dial up the amount that it blocks. So if you've got a full moon, you can make the moon dimmer. If you've got a part crescent moon, you can make it less dim. And what's great about these is that you can, you can disassemble it. And you can put one half on your eyepiece and one half in your telescope, and you can rotate the eyepiece and do it that way. So you don't have to pull the eyepiece out and, and, and dial it. So you can just That's turn the eyepiece. Cool. That's a cool idea. And these are fantastic for enhancing uh, the Jupiter and Venus because when they're so bright, they glare and they bloat. But you can just dial the um, the brightness of them down, and you can start picking up details that you can't see when they're full strength. So that's a great general purpose filter. Oh, and by the way, the um, the nebula filters, if you use those on Jupiter, you can enhance some of the belts and the equatorial belts and things on Jupiter. Even though they're made for nebulas, they still work on on the planets. Cool. Uh, so Batonoff mask. Um, Batonoff mask tends to be more useful for imagers. It's a tool that you put on the front of the objective of your telescope that turns your stars into um, patterns that you can use to guide your focusing. So that's kind of a, that's not one I use. Uh, if you have a Newtonian telescope, you could get a collimator. That's handy to have. Um, I need a collimator because my telescope is one of the truss style that comes apart. I assemble it on site. So I need to check the collimation every time. Uh, where's my sky phone? Is it here? Wireless. If you want to turn your telescope, if you have a go-to telescope and you want to turn it into a wireless telescope, you can use one of these. So this sets up a little hotspot and then your phone logs into the hotspot. And if you've got Sky Safari or some of the other apps, um, Celestron make a make an app that pairs with this. I think it's free. Um, and then you can wirelessly control your mount using this, which is really cool. And what's great about this is that if your if the hand controller in your mount doesn't have the latest comets or asteroids or something like that, if you're using Sky Safari or Stellarium or something to run your mount, then it's got the latest catalogs. So you can always find the things using this. Hmm. That's a that's a cool one. Could you, I guess you could in theory also then work it from inside and run out once it got to the spot that it was going so that you could spend less time in the cold. Yeah, it's it's just uh, basically, yeah, I mean, it's, I've got a window near me. I could set my telescope out on the front courtyard and I could sit inside the living room and, and do it that way if I wanted to. Sure. That, that's been- another, that's another Another session. level. Yeah. <laughs> um, there's a quick uh, suggestion from Larry as well, suggesting a three foot three legged folding stool for sitting down to observe. Good idea. Yes. Well, on my, on my honorable mentions, I have my observing <laughs> chair. So Name observing chairs are more prepared than Chris for real. Observing like, chairs are great. They're variable height and you can see better when you're relaxed. So that's the, per- that's the benefit of the observing chair. So that's that one, yeah. For amateur uh, presence of this professional. Yeah. Um, solar filters for white light observing the sun. So that's a neat accessory that you can have if you've got a, a telescope like Alendria has behind her. Yep. Um, somebody who, who wants to give her a gift could give her a nice solar filter that goes on that telescope and she can see yep. the sun in white light. I'm yeah. really, I'm looking at this and thinking like because it also has that little sun finder at the top. Yeah. That's neat. Do you want me to forward yeah. this video onto your family and friends, Alandria? 
<laughs> oh. yeah, here's mine. So there's the solar filter. Mm -hmm. And then there's a little helper with the hole in the front and a, and a screen at the back. And so when the telescope's aimed at the sun, then they line up and you know you're, you don't have to look through the telescope, which you're not wanting to do. Or through your red dot finder and then like blind yourself. Yeah. Yeah, if you've got a finder scope in your telescope and you're using it for the sun, always cap or take the finder scope off the telescope before you use it for the sun. Yeah. Important. So yeah, that's a great one for, for people that have a, a refractor. The, um, the solar, fil solar filters for refractors are not that expensive. You can also get full aperture solar filters, white light filters for Dobsonians as well, if you wanted to do that as well. So that's that. Uh, smartphone adapters. Oh. Ray, sorry, I heard it and I was on a different page looking for links, but we have smartphone adapters. Yeah. So that's a terrific way if you want to capture images of mainly brighter things that your telescope's looking at. So the moon, Saturn, Jupiter. I'm going to, can I elaborate? Sure. I have two. I have this one. It's the cheaper option. This is the more expensive one. This is the Celestron XYZ. This is the Celestron no name, not Celestron XYZ, but I think it's still Celestron brand. It is. Um, I actually prefer this one. <laughs> um, I don't know about you, Chris. I find that this does not get my, I don't know if it's me. I don't know what, but because this is so wide, this part that grips onto the eyepiece, I can't mm. get my phone close enough to the eyepiece to take pictures with this. This is much thinner and it grips on to like, I can move it up and down the eyepiece much better. Mm -hmm. um, and I can therefore, and then like this, when I put it in, which I can't do right now, but because it's too small and it'll take forever to unwind, which is a, a downside, but it's much closer to where this is, which means that you have more options for like how far away you can, I don't know, like it, it seems to focus better for me anyway. But you, you do realize that, that one of these dials thing. is yeah. forwards and backwards, right? I know, but it's, it's, it's just that like, I, sometimes I can't, sometimes the eyepiece will sit like only this far in and I need it to be all the way up here, but it's physically stopped from being all the way up there by the telescope itself or something like that. So try, try, um, releasing the eyepiece and drawing it out of centimeters. You can do that. Those are sure. the rules. Sure. Those are the rules. Yeah. <laughs> Thank okay. You. That probably would work better then. All right, let's move on. Let's see. Uh, things beside the telescope. So I had, I mentioned the headlamp. Um, so when I'm doing my observing, I found one of these things. I found this thing at the York University bookstore, not York University, uh, Seneca College bookstore years ago. And what it is, is it's a string of LED lights. And when I attach it to my little lithium battery pack, I have a red reading lamp that I can put over my log book and I can make all my notes under red light conditions. Not so bad. that's a cool item. Yeah. So there's that one, there's red flashlights. Uh, what else do we have here? Oh, stylus. So if you are using Sky Safari and it's winter, get yourself a stylus. So you don't have to take your gloves off to swipe with your fingers, except for zooming in and out, you need to use the plus and minus button. I'll suggest as well, any gloves that have touch capabilities. Yeah. yeah. Or the gloves that open up, like you said. Yep, those two. Uh, let's see, observing chair we talked about, eye patch. So if you're chasing galaxies come springtime, it's really a good idea to put an eye patch over the eye that you use in the eyepiece and keep that eye from getting any stray light. Maybe a car drives by or somebody sends you a text and your phone lights up. And then when you're ready, just flip the eye patch up and take a look at your galaxy. Be a modern day that. pirate. I've also seen a friend of ours walk around with red with a red visor on. I've, I've, oh, I've seen clever. that. Yeah. yeah. Someday, someday I tells ya we'll have Rask branded eye patches in our store someday. Sure. It'd be harder to find. It's a good spot for the crest right there on the. <laughs> yeah, eye just a little crest. Fail the seas of a Milky Way. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> perfect. Perfect. Uh, yeah, so things that you can do, crazy things you can do. So there, I, I put a link to this astrogizmos.com website, which is a US-based site, but they've got all kinds of really fun and, and cool 
gadgets, LED lights. You can, um, you can buy little kick me knots that, that you can put on your tripod legs that legs that make people aware that there are, there are feet there not to trip on. Um, they've got all kinds of different kinds of, of lights. Um, you can even send away and get uh, interior lights for your car in, in red LED. And it's up to you to just go ahead and swap all those out. So your car is now a red LED. Oh, Absolutely. like inside, like the inside. Yeah. So when you open your car door, it doesn't shine with white light. It shines with red light. Mm. So you can do that. Specific um, I put in the, yeah. Yeah. Um, Maison Astronomy, I, I also put a link there. They, they sell a nice a ball head that's not too expensive. I haven't used it, but it might be, it looks like something that'd be good for mounting your camera on. Um, batteries, they have to have that lots of batteries, have spare batteries. You know, you can buy the, um, the 2032s. These are what you use in a lot of the finder scopes. Yep. Use these. So it's great to have a few of those on hand all the time. Um, in terms of battery batteries, you know, I've got a big old power tank with a lead acid battery in it, but now, you know, the lithium ones are all the rage. So um, the one I just showed you with the, the light from Seneca, that's, um, I think that's a 10, 10,000 milliamp battery. This one, I'm not sure what it is, but you know, it's, it's really great that now we can power our scopes with much lighter equipment. Last up. You're we are getting close to time and I was wondering if you could do the cool things. Cause I was looking at your list of cool things, whatever you've got there is totally great, but I saw that you have some cool things. The cool gifts, the popular mechanics ones. Yeah. And the beers and the, and the space beers. Yeah. Yeah. So let me open up the link to these open hyperlink. Well, why don't you open the, do you want to share your sure, screen I'll, and open I'll that share link? my screen? Yeah. yeah. Um, I haven't opened all the links, but um. Here is Popular Mechanics. This is, see, this is 100% my, my level of interest. I know a lot of you all like observing. I like observing too, but I'm very much like, ooh, art and planetaria and whatnot. 50 things to see in the sky, also good. This, like 100%, this is my style. Blankets, glow in the dark blankets. Like, yeah, totally. Mm -hmm. Color changing mug. Heat changing planet mug. Cool. Yeah, it's very cool. But my tea always gets cold because I forget about it. You That's what you need. Get a dew heater. You need this. <laughs> get a dew heater for my planet mug. Duh. Yeah. <laughs> Just full of all the best ideas. Oh, yeah. Um, one of the things I'll mention, which I know is not really a space specific gift. Actually, this is super cute. I really like that. Oh, I should get that for doing demos. That's a really good idea. Um. One of the things I'll recommend is there's a website that does um, uh, acoustic paneling. So soundproof panels or soundproofing type panels that you can have your own art printed onto. Um, mm -hmm. And as someone who does a lot of video calls um, that are space related and has very echoey walls, um, it's definitely something that I've been thinking of. Oh, very nice. I like that one. So lots of cool stuff there. Look at this beer. Yeah, I had fun beer? finding. This is just a small sampling of the different space and astro themed beers you can get in Ontario these days, and I'm sure elsewhere too. The Big Dippa, get it? Because like an IPA, Big nice. Dippa. Uh, nice. Oh no! Oh, so good. So uh, a number of years ago, we did one of the family at one of the family gatherings at the holidays. We did one of the, um, you know, this this the gift exchanges, and it was. Uh, you know, five dollar limit or something like that. And I went to the to the liquor store and I bought a couple of nice tall cans of beer as my package. Stayed in the budget, and it was so popular. Everyone was stealing it from one another as it went around. <laughs> That's amazing. I love it. So yeah, if you're if you want to do astronomy themed beers, you can find a bunch of them there. And Very I cool. will say that that Lagrange beer. I mean, all of these are Canadian, I think. But Lagrange was in London. And um, Mill Street is, of course. No, sorry, that was Main Street Brewing. I'm not entirely sure where that is. Um, but they're Canadian. So kudos, yeah. Chris, for choosing Canadian beer. Mm -hmm. No, I very deliberately did that. That's right. Awesome. Cool. Um, yeah, so we're coming up the last few minutes. Uh, just a couple, uh, just to clean up a little bit. Um, a little toolkit. So this is actually a multi-bit screwdriver with the different types of screwdriver bits on it. Um, right. A set of Allen keys. You never know when your telescope, something will fall apart, something will fall off. 
if you're with a group, if you're with a bunch of rascals, then ch- chances are someone's got the tool you need. But, you know, if you're camping or something like that, it's good to have, t- you'll have tools anyway of some sort. So mm-hmm. your telescope can use that. Um, in terms of, you know, we talked about our books. Uh, we did our books preview show um, a couple of months ago. A lot of those same books are fantastic. Um, what are they? What are they? At the eyepiece, I use the Cambridge Double Star Atlas is one I really like if you're not using an app. Um, the 110 things to see with a telescope, highly recommend that one. Uh, what else have I got here? Sky News Magazine with the month, with the every two months sky chart, really handy to have at hand. And then if you want to get really advanced, you can use the big Night Sky Observer's Guide. Um, a lot of people may have picked up on is that the publisher, Wilman Bell, they went out of business, but they've been purchased by the, um, American Astronomical Society, AAS, I think it is. Mm -hmm. And so if you go to shop at Sky now, which is Sky and Telescope um, shopping portal, they're now bringing these books out again. So if you've got uh, titles that you've been missing because they went out when it went under, you can now start getting them again. So this is a great book. There's actually um, several volumes in this one. Uh, Yeah, so I think that's a great overview. I'm going to plug, sorry, last real quick thing. I'm going to plug my own stuff Um, because we do so much work with the robotic telescope in California. Um, We have the 2021 data available for purchase in our store. There are tons of targets. There's over 30 targets. Um, There's some really great stuff in there. If anyone's interested in playing around with some astrophotography data, Sky News recently did an editing series and is still, I think, still doing it. Right, Alondra? Yeah, it's, we've only done three out of eight. Uh, So we have five more left to go. That has free data. So if you're interested in like playing with it first, um, same data is taken, well, it's data taken with the same scope, but it's different data. So it's not in this set. The set yeah. is unique. Um, if you're interested in playing around with it more and like expanding your um, skill set, this is, this is a great thing for astrophotographers, especially ones who don't have their own rig um, or they're looking to just get into it and start practicing with some really high quality data. Just sent the link in the chat. It's great. So I was just scrolling through the chat. Amazing. Amazing. I, you know, I, I, I feel a little sad because I'm not able to keep an eye on the chat. So everyone watching is getting the benefit of the chat. Those are some great ideas in there. So fantastic. Thanks everybody. As always, thank you all for joining us. Um, the video will be available on YouTube afterwards. Um, a lot of the links that I have shared in here are in that YouTube description, um, sometimes more than what I've shared here. So there's the link to the YouTube video for anyone who's interested in going back and looking at some of the stuff that we have suggested. Um, Thanks everyone for joining. We'll keep you posted. Keep an eye on the RASC newsletter and on RASC.ca and in your um, inbox, we do send out the automatic reminders once like an hour before each session. Keep an eye on those for what's gonna be happening um, in the next couple of weeks. And we will see you next time. We do have some really fun content. We also, I will plug, it's not for next week. Sorry, it's not for two weeks from now, but I will say that we are also beginning to incorporate some indigenous astronomy content to our, yes. our um, programming. And so keep an eye out for that. It should be uh, really awesome. Thanks everyone for joining and we'll see you all next time.